And let's take a look at shares of Disney. They are higher by a little bit more than a percent off the after hour session highs. This on news that there is a shakeup at the board. David Faber broke this news in just the last hour. He joins us now with the very latest. Hi, David. Hey, I'm Melissa. Yeah, you know, we're uh, going to spend a lot of time talking about this, probably uh, focusing a little bit too much attention on a high profile proxy fight that's going to break out. Uh, Nelson Peltz is going to try to get on the board of directors at Disney because they said, we're not interested in you joining the board of directors of Disney, Mr. Peltz. He's a significant shareholder. Last count, maybe $800 million worth of stock. Uh, they've known he's been there for some time. In fact, Ch Bob Chapek, the former CEO, was aware of P Peltz's presence, as was the board. And then the board did get rid of Mr. Chapek, but that apparently wasn't enough to satisfy Mr. Peltz. We're going to learn more from him, uh, I would assume, in the not-too-distant future in terms of what it is that he really is after here. But the main thing he's after right now is getting himself on that board. That board's currently 12 people. It's going to go down to 11 because Susan Arnold is going to be stepping down at the next annual meeting. She will be replaced by Mark Parker uh, as the company's chairman. Of course, the man in the middle there is Bob Iger. Longtime CEO who stepped back into that role after roughly a three year absence from that role, not quite, um, uh, and um, is tasked with, you know, fighting off or helping to fight off Mr. Uh, Mr. Peltz, although much of the board, the lead director, the new chairman or the existing chairman will be part of that effort. And leading this company, of course, that he's only been back at for what has it been? Uh, two, weeks, two months, not even uh, that long. And again, Melissa, you know, trying to understand exactly what it is that Peltz is after is going to be a key thing here. Um, you know, he, uh, I believe, is fairly close to Ike Perlmutter, he used to run Marvell, sold it to Disney, and then has been a thorn in Iger's side for some time, it would appear. Um, costs certainly going to be important here. He's going to be focused, one would expect as well, on the lack of shareholder return over the last number of years. Now, that includes COVID. He is also going to be focused on the fact that he believes they overpaid for the Fox assets. That was a deal that Mr. Iger did. That said, much of the debt at the company is also a result of debt taken on in the spring of 2020 when the company, of course, faced the, its parks not open, its movie making not open. Uh, and needed to take on debt to just simply make it through to a certain extent that period and continue to fund, of course, um, its streaming business. So any number of questions here that we have that I expect over time will get filled. One important uh, uh, thing to mention here, universal proxy access. This may help uh, Mr. Peltz. You know, essentially, Disney's going to have to include him on their proxy that gets sent to shareholders. And they were 12. They're going to be 11. He'll be the 12th name it may be quite helpful to him um, in that way because he doesn't have to go through so many of the, the different difficulties that faced uh, activists in the past when they were pursuing proxy fights. Universal proxy access certainly making it easier. This will be one of the first tests. Melissa, as you know, uh, Peltz, I mean, you know, the last proxy fight was P&G. He's on the board of Unilever right now. You can go way back, of course, to the fights at Heinz and DuPont. There have been so many through the years. This one could be an interesting one. <laughs> I mean, you mentioned P&G, and that cost Procter & Gamble how much money in terms of fending it off? I mean, that was probably the biggest, I don't want to say waste of money, but they, they spent dearly to fend off that proxy battle. They did. I mean, I think they're still counting votes. Remember how close that was? <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, you know, he did get on the board. It went fairly well. The stock price actually responded quite positively. I think um, Disney certainly will point out at some point that he has no experience in the media business, uh, unlike, you know, any number of their other directors, including, by the way, the recently added Carolyn Ever Everson, a longtime Facebook executive who's now on the Disney board. Remember, Dan Loeb was there in mid-August. He had a number of proposals. He was supportive of Mr. Chapik, at least at that time, but certainly also had some focus on cost and cost discipline that he felt was lacking at Disney. Uh, again, remains somewhat unclear exactly what we'll hear from Peltz. Yeah. I don't think he has some great ideas, Melissa, in terms of how to completely change the business, but ESPN could come into focus again, and certainly cost and simply the lack of shareholder return over a long period of time now is going to be part of his campaign. All right, David, thank you for bringing us the latest. David Faber on the story for us. Um, the lack of media experience seems like uh, 
I don't know, not a very good argument. There are plenty of people on that board who you would point to and say, do they? Does Mary Barra have media experience? But Nelson Peltz has great consumer product experience. Consumer product experience. And, and boy, last time I checked, you know, activism uh, is, should be agitating for things that shareholders should like. Forget what, what the board likes. And I, I get that. And I would get back to this as a shareholder in Disney. These are important headlines, uh, but they're not the headlines for the stock that, that move it. The most important headlines are that the streaming losses uh, are cut substantially in 2023. Uh, Bob Iger is focused on profitability. I think that's very important. Uh, the question of are they going to spin off ABC, ESPN, these dynamics, I don't think they're going to in the short to medium term. But it gets back to also Disney's valuation relative both to Netflix, which it's now trading at about four times uh, streaming revs, and Netflix is a little bit more. And I think the street at one point was giving Disney a lot more credit. It was and it was getting, a, you know, seven or eight times uh, revs multiple on their streaming business, whereas Netflix was getting five or six. Um, Disney's getting less. And, and again, we talked about this yesterday with Netflix. Netflix is more profitable. I own them both. I want to see profitability. You were just talking about uh, Disney earlier in the day. Yep. I own, the, I own them both as well. Go ahead. Right, right. Does this make you more bullish? It does make me more bullish. And, and you know, I'm not, I, I think Bob Iger, every, everyone both investors and everyone in the business community trust Bob Iger. And that's the big thing, is you want to trust who's ever as steering the ship. And you know my thesis here. Disney should never be trading at the pandemic low. This is not a pandemic low environment for Disney. But remember what Loeb said. They should be getting a, a, a hybrid valuation. And they were not getting that hybrid valuation based on their streaming business. So that's where the stock really took off when Dan Loeb started to make those comments. I'm long. I think this thing should be up 10, 15 percent at least.